African food for us. Yes. And there is a difference between African and soul food. You explained it to me. Yes. And Natasha Tory is the Sheboygan <laughs> City Judge. We voted for her. <laughs> we will vote for her next time also. All right. Okay, Natasha, tell us a little okay. about yourself. Sure. So, uh, as Marilyn indicated, I'm Natasha Tory. I'm an attorney, and I'm also the municipal court judge. And um, I don't know how Emily, Emily and I started talking about uh, me coming and doing co some cooking with Marilyn because I love I love to cook. And um, I asked, well, hey, could we do something near Juneteenth? Because even though Juneteenth has been a holiday since 1866, um, a lot more of us are now starting to you know realize that. And so even last year, the law firm that I work at uh, started recognizing it as a paid day off. So I even get off on on um, on Monday. And so the history of Juneteenth, if, if you um, didn't have a chance to look through this wonderful handout that Anne put together, basically was to celebrate when the last group of slaves in the U.S. finally were told that slavery was abolished. And, so, and what's amazing and really sad about this is um, these were slaves in Texas who were still slaves two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation and about three months after the Civil War was even over. They were never told. So their slave masters were still killing them, whipping them, and, you know, enslaving them. And so we had some soldiers from the north came down and told them, hey, you're free. And so then it was, it became a, a celebration, right, that they had made it. And so some of the um, imagery that you'll see um, in, in the handout are, um, this is what I um, think of as the Juneteenth flag, but honestly, the flag above this is actually the Juneteenth flag, okay? But just because we're a big country, uh, we have different regions, um, maybe down south, the blue, the red, white, and blue flag would be more commonly known for Juneteenth, but in, uh, here in Wisconsin, we use this Pan-African flag. And it, so it has, basically, it looks like the U.S. flag, but the stripes are red and black. And then, it, and then the star section is a green background with black stars. And so and there's symbolism for that. So the red is a very prominent color in both African culture food and then in um, and African American food, and so that's why we have the red tea today. So the red red drink, very common um, in African and African American food. So it, um, it could be hibiscus tea um, in Africa. There's also a cola nut tea, but then also in the U.S. Um, there became an association with red, even like red soda, because that was just something that we couldn't have, right? We couldn't have sugar and sweets and those things. So the color red. So if you're familiar with um, red Red, um, red velvet cake. That is a very common food um, to associate with like any soul food or African American holiday. Um, so, but red in the flag is to represent our blood, the blood that we had to spill basically because of slavery. But it also represents life that we're still here, and so we can still go on. The black, really basic, just rep supposed to represent black skin of, of Africa and the black soil of Africa, and then the the green is supposed to represent fertility of. Africa. And so it's really important to understand that, um, you know, you could say, well, why did you need a flag? You know, and, and so I, to understand because we don't know where we came from, right? So I'm, I'm biracial. Um, I have, my, my mom is white. She is Italian and Polish and Czechoslovakian, right? And I know that. And I know what those flags look like. You know, but my, my dad is um, part African American and Cherokee. I have no, we have no clue where he came from in Africa. He was kidnapped, right? And even Tori, my last name, that was my, my great-great-grandfather's slave master's name. It's not some family name, like, because it came through history. It's because somebody owned us. And so that's why it's important, you know, to have a flag, right? And so this is, um, you know, th this is the African-American flag. So when I was a kid, um, so I indicated biracial, um, both my parents were in the Army, and um, I was born in the late 70s, and it started to be like a popular thing, I think especially for military people, to just be colorblind. 
So I, you know, just like this concept of if we just ignore it, it doesn't really exist, which is not the smartest way, to, to, especially for kids. Um, and so I, I grew up partially in North Carolina and then in Wisconsin and never really had a firm understanding of, of African American culture because I was being taught to be colorblind. Um, so, and I didn't even know how to cook at all. So I grew up eating um, lots of food from boxes. So, um, you know, so what did I think was dinner? Like, well, first of all, it always had to be meat, okay? So fried chicken and, and you know, and it would be like a can, right? I never was really exposed to fresh vegetables. Everything was canned. Um, maybe I would get fresh fruit, but it would always be like some type of, you know, spaghetti and meatballs, and then maybe there'd be like iceberg lettuce. So when I got to law school, um, which I went to UW-Madison, I was surrounded by um, people from all over the world, and it was and I was I was really I was really young and um, at that time and hadn't been exposed to, to people really hadn't really like like that hadn't really learned about different cultures, um, and so I just soaked it up. And so it was really funny because when I first started cooking, my best friends were a woman from Okinawa, a Korean girl, and a Kenyan. And so that's like all I didn't know how to make like like regular, you know, like food, but I could make, you know, like a mean teriyaki, you know, and, and my, you know, um, and I knew how to make kimchi, and just like, you know, just stuff that you don't like normally learn how to make as your first meals. All right, so now here I am, you know, many years later, um, loving, love cooking. I try to eat vegetarian most of the time. And so I thought, okay, look, for Juneteenth, what would be um, a nice dish for us? And so um, we're having what's called um, African peanut stew. And it's really funny because I, so I've been making peanut stew um, for years. Usually I make it um, around holidays or like a special occasion. And I was joking that, you know, I hadn't thought about about it that to, to make it for 11 o'clock today, I had to get up at like three o'clock in the morning, right? Oh, no. So, you know, if I had to rethink this, yeah, um, maybe, maybe it'd be a little different. But so this is really good. Um, this is my favorite recipe. And, and you have it, and it's from Rachel Ama's um, Vegan Eats. She is um, from the Caribbean. I love this cookbook, and I, so I've made lots of different peanut stews. This is my favorite, and I made it to the recipe. So you know, like people will say, like give you a recipe, and they're like, but don't do this. No, you can make it to the recipe. Um, I heard a little bit of talk about, well, not understanding grams. Well, most, um, you know, cans, if you're gonna use canned stuff, will have the grams, like if you're, if you're you're worried about tomatoes. Um, this is something that you don't have to worry about messing up, okay? So this is something you can imagine people being outside over a fire and having their one pot and making this, right? So you're not gonna mess it up. And no measuring cups. You don't have to, okay? <laughs> I eyeballed everything um, today, but the, and then I measured it to make sure. <laughs> Because I was like, no, that's not what we're doing. We're doing exactly to the recipe. Um, so another thing uh, to think about um, with the peanut stew, again, um, this traditionally, you know, coming together um, for for celebration. This one, this one is vegan, and that's cool because that means everyone can have it. Right, so that's something that's um, important in, in lots of different different cultures. Some people might not eat meat, right? Or you might you might not eat a certain type of meat. But if you make something vegan, then it's accessible for everyone. So that's what we'll be doing today. Um, also, uh, we have naan, and so that's what Marilyn was teasing you about. What's in the um, what's in the pan? And this naan was made over the grill. Um, and so I'm going to demonstrate making naan um, in a skillet because you can do that too. Um, and all it is is like a simple dough recipe, which is just flour, um, baking powder, some sugar and salt and, and yeast, and you let it rise, punch it down, and then you can form it in these little patties and grill it up, and it only takes like three minutes, and you can have fresh bread, right? So again, imagine being outside um, and, and... And how authentic is naan to the cuisine, or it's just that you like it? Well, so naan is what we think we traditionally associate with India. But do, do you know African peanut stew is really just sweet potato curry? Sure. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, and so we like to think that we're so unique, right? And everything is, but but there's so there's so much crossover. And so yes, you know, you probably are familiar with having Indian curry with naan. Um, and so this is an African curry, right? Your main ingredient in this, even though it's called peanut stew, is sweet potatoes. So I think that we're ready to, to get started. I just gonna say a couple of words about the, the coconut. Oh yes. Masha made it clear that coconut is dessert. Yes. So I tried finding macaroons at bakeries, had no luck. So yesterday I made the macaroons. And of course the one with the cherry, that's the one with the coconut and the condensed milk. And the recipe is one can of condensed milk and 14 ounces of coconut. Of course you know there are no such thing as 14 ounce packages of coconut any long, longer than only, no, 12. <laughs> And, and of course, they probably started out as 16 ounces. Right. So anyway, and the next one is a meringue that has coconut and almonds and Rice Krispies in it, and I salted them before I put them in the oven. So any meringue recipe that you have will work if you add coconut and anything to it. But the trick to make a meringue actually work is room temperature egg whites, Put them out the night before, even divide them the night before. And then add the sugar slowly, slower than you can stand it, and it will get stiff. And if it says a quarter of a teaspoon of cream of tartar, put in at least half a teaspoon. And then you've got your meringue, your macaroon meringues. And Delicious. I did get from Le from the art center this Levitt schedule, so now you will also know the music and when it's coming to the city green. You're on, Natasha. All right. So I'm going to start. Um, hope see if I can. Oh, look it! I got the burner right the first try. Just you guys can't see this, but I had lots of choices here, and I I want credit for that. All right. So this is this is my dough, um, and so again, this was um, we made this this morning. Uh, you know, just gave the. I think it took like I think the recipe called for an hour and 15 minutes to let the the dough rise. It's bread yeast dough. You can yes. Any bread recipe yeast yes. Dough? Okay. Yes, and it's really simple. And I realize I just need to make sure I have a spatula, which I see a rubber one, so that should be fine. Okay. All right. And so you just flatten it out. And so these I asked for just like smaller personal size ones. So you can make it, you know, as big as you want. Um, and your pan doesn't have oil that you can, like, it's, you're, it's not sitting in oil. So basically, if this wouldn't have already been perfectly prepared for me, again, thank you, thank Marilyn. Uh, you would take, you would take, um, you would take like a paper towel and put oil on it and just like um, spread it in, okay? Natasha, they sort of look like mini yeast tortillas. And yes. I make a lot of tortillas at my house. Yes. Before. Flour tortillas, not corn. They're way too hot. Okay. Yes, Candace. Peter's been to many former Soviet Union countries, and all he's talked about is not. Okay. So it isn't just in those areas. It's all across that. And they have these big uh, containers in the ground fire, and they slap it against the wall and they make it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. so that's like like it sounds like a tandoori oven. But I don't have that No. <laughs> so I probably could have waited a little bit longer. Like I could have had the pan um, a little bit hotter before we put it in. But this is just an example of like you just it's really hard to mess it up. Okay, once you once you have your dough formed um, and it's it was in the right consistency, it, it's really hard to mess it up. I like to hear those words. Yeah, it, and so. If, if the pan was hot enough, it only is supposed to take about 90 seconds on each side. And I, if you, I can see that it's actually like fluffing up in the pan right now. All right, and so then I'm gonna just, and, it, and it's hard, like I can actually tell that it gets cooked. All right. That 
Yeah. The longest must be the rising time. It is. Yeah. So once once you mix it and then you're just like cutting it and I don't do the putsy work like this in my house. So my husband had to get up and do this. Um, that's Good just for you. that's just not my thing. Uh, and but he had been warned at least you know. He, I told him at least a couple weeks ago. So. And one thing about yeast, though, if it rises too tall, too tall, it can fall. Big deal. You just need it and then let it rise again. Or if all of a sudden you have to do something and the yeast dough is ready, punch it down. So do you see again. like how that it almost looks like a, like a pancake? So the ones if you want to show that um, that my husband made for us this morning, he made these on the grill, just so that you could get even more of an idea of like being yes. Um, just so you could get more of an idea of like being outside, you know. Oh, yeah. So this is all food. Imagine somebody cooking it outside over a fire. So these are done. Wow. Okay. So now we're gonna start getting putting our um, our right. stew together. So the so I um, I made basmati rice and um, one thing one I don't know if it's a trick secret whatever but I was taught. Uh, by my Okinawan friend, I had to think about it, to soak your rice. Not just wash it, but to actually soak it. Um, well, this time I soaked it overnight. Oh, that's and if cool. you if you do that, it not only I was just reading about all the health benefits, but basically it gets rid of that outer layer of extra starch. So I'm going to ask you to um, scrape it out. I'm going to tip this okay. over. This is really heavy. You guys can't laugh at me. All right. And um, it and it makes it makes the rice sweeter. So, and then what, the soaking water you drain away? Yes, so I have a really nice rice oh, washer. Oops, almost, a little bit more. And um, it has a special, like, little strainer section um, to, to, that you can, like, pour the water out. But if you, it really makes a huge difference. And so this rice, you know, imagine I, I had this done. Marilyn's like, I eat no later than 7.30. So I had to have this at, at her, her house. And she did, she did. But and you live close to me. I, I do. Like only five minutes. Good. Um, but yeah, it, it still is able to keep the rice like in relatively good separation, right? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, and, and that helps. Like that's from it's, it's, soaking it's it. it's not glued together. Right. Yeah, so soaking the rice, that's my pro tip for today. All right, and do you, can some of you smell it in the front? This is basmati rice. That's my favorite. I love it. I love the way it smells. But not short grain, or it will glue together. Yeah, this is long is grain. Which is what we want for some things, but no. Yes, that's long grain. All right. Okay. okay. Whatever you say. So this is our our peanut stew. Okay. So this, you know, you can, this is heavy. <laughs> All Are you right. Sure you don't Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to show off that I've been lifting weights. Look at that. And oh my gosh. This is, so this is peanuts. I had to do, I'm sorry. No, I'm fine. Your recipe says canned black eyed peas. I, did, I don't do canned black eyed peas. So that is, I guess, technically um, one thing that I did different. So these are black eyed peas that I made in the slow cooker, okay? And then, um, this is cilantro. I have four kids and normally the kids have to do this for me, but um, grandpa's visiting. So I, uh, if you feel that the cilantro isn't like to your perfect chopped liking, uh, I don't care today, okay? <laughs> All right, all right, and then these are just peanuts. So you, I'm just gonna top it with peanuts. These are unsalted because we get enough salt um, in the dish. And then this is juice of six lemons. Yep. So you just top it. So you just like kind of pour it around, and then it give, that just gives it this nice like fresh light. Um, taste to the finish. 
Natasha, instead of fresh lemon, have you ever tried that frozen lemon juice? No. Okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I well, for one, I love I love using fresh lemon because especially if you just cut up the garlic and you have that garlic on your hands, I like to finish but with the lemon because it gets that garlic off. And um, yeah, that's that's enough reason. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Now, of course, lemons here cost a lot of money for a lemon, and one of the tricks to make to get more juice out of your lemon, cut it in half. Hold it in your hand. We learned this from the lemon class two, three, five, six years ago. Put the fork in there and do you want to get a photo? it out with the fork, and you'll get lots more juice than squeezing. And limes too. Cut it in half. Get a photo? Put it in your hand. Put the fork in and ream it out with the fork. You'll get a lot more juice. Yeah. So I like using um, these. Uh, old-fashioned lemon juicers I love it yeah oh, yes. yes so, right, so right. that that's what I used for this sure. got it in an antique store yeah. they're not as hard on our muscles as right. those squeezing things yes you get tired I don't very I don't use those no. okay so I think we're gonna start um, dishing it out yep. does anybody have any questions yes okay so what you should figure is, um, so I, I tripled this recipe. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, so, if, so basically for one serving, it would be like three sweet potatoes. So I would say that they're like, like half pound sweet potatoes, okay? Three normal, like longer, bigger. Real, yeah. real sweet potatoes, not the can. <laughs> yeah. Yes. She was giving you guys a, lo a softball question there. You, nobody had. Nobody wondered that. Yeah, right. We have very smart people. <laughs> and, and we're not going to call you by role. You're grown adults. You know how to come and get your food. Okay. Yes.
so that one might take a little, um, you know, a little more like room. But to be honest with you, um, you can. It's in, it's making the curry, and so you could always substitute. Like you can, you can make curries taste differently. So I was explaining to a couple in the back. Like if I was making this myself, I usually add a lot more curry to it, um, and, I, and I make it like a little more spicy. Um, so you oh, can always just yeah, make. You know. <laughs> kerosene. Really? It's just, mine, mine does smell kind of like garlic. Okay, all right. Yeah, and, um, and it was monks would eat that instead of garlic because they didn't want to get upset and you know, they were thinking that like garlic was <laughs> so, All right, do we have any, any other questions? No? You can ask me about anything then. Any, any, any questions about uh, anything at all? What did you eat for breakfast today? Today I had a banana. One, take your pick. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I've done lots of stuff. Like, I've, I'm in my 22nd year of practicing law now. Um, I used to do all family law, which was like, you know, it's always dramatic. Yeah. Um, I would say that maybe one of my most fulfilling cases involved a family farm and being able to save that, which was like, I just went into private practice and um, was trying to do something different, and I got this case that I felt like I was in over my head, but nobody else was going to take it anyway, so I could, and then, and then I won. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> so that was the problem. <laughs> yeah, for a vegetable stock, did you make your own stock? No, I've never made my own stock. I am told, I'm, I'm like an efficient, I told you, I didn't even make the naan. That's not my type of job, okay? <laughs> Making stock, I keep celery ends and onion peels and carrot peelings and garlic ends and you know the herbs that just turn slimy in your refrigerator, throw them in the freezer and some bones of anything and then finally put them all in a pot and let them cook for six, eight hours. Now there is more to making perfect stock that's clear with egg whites. I don't do that. I just take all the big chunks out and just put the rest in jars in the freezer. So it always tastes different. Yes. <laughs> Natasha, thank you for coming. Right. You're welcome. All right. All right. Thanks, Natasha. Okay, well, thanks. Thank you.